And please welcome Honza. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, so uh, my name is Honza Kral, and uh, somebody somebody asked me to come come here to talk about uh, Elasticsearch and Python. The reason for that is because I work for Elastic, the company that is responsible for Elasticsearch, uh, that that uh, creates created the project in the first place. And my role in the company is uh, everything Python related. Uh, so I actually created and maintained the, the Python connection uh, library. And that's mostly what I'll, I would like to talk about here is uh, how it was created, what are the guiding principles, and hopefully some examples, and maybe some, uh, some plans for the future. So before we get started, we need to, you know, no good talk uh, begins without a definition. So uh, what, is, what is Elasticsearch? So how many people here are familiar with Elasticsearch? Maybe use it? Awesome. This makes me very happy. And it also means that we can keep the introductions fairly brief. Uh, so Elasticsearch is a, is a, I think the official title is Open Source Distributed Search and Analytics Engine. What that means is what we can we can break it we can break it apart. So it is open source. It is written in Java, unfortunately, but we do our very best to hide that fact from you. You don't actually have to. There is not a single line of XML anywhere in sight, and it's very it's very sane. It's it's very very easy to to get running. Uh, it is distributed, which means that it was designed from the ground up to run on multiple machines uh, as, a, as a clustered solution. And that brings some interesting repercussions into what the client needs to be. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see that in detail later on. And that is search and analytics engine. So we, we had a tough time defining what Elasticsearch is. Is it a database? Not really. Is it a search engine? Sure. Is it an analytics engine? Sure, but what does that mean? Essentially, Elasticsearch is a piece of software that you can run on one or multiple machines. You can store data in it. You can search the data using both uh, structured and unstructured search, uh, meaning normal filtering, but also uh, uh, full, text, uh, full text searching. And also, you can analyze the data, aggregating them, slicing them, dicing them, et cetera, which is very useful for visualizations and for data exploration. Uh, and because it is distributed, it also scales very well. And uh, as I mentioned, it primarily uses JSON. So anything that you, you can express as JSON, you can store in Elasticsearch as a document uh, via an HTTP REST API. So everything that Elasticsearch does, it exposes over, uh, over REST, uh, simple, simple JSON and HTTP idea, which leads to uh, this, this kind of behavior. This is how you would use how you would use Elasticsearch, how you could use Elasticsearch. Because everybody knows HTTP, right? It's I, I hear HTTP, I'm already typing import requests. And then I, I talk to Elasticsearch on port 9200, that's the default. And I can I can just index a document. So do put on, on this URL. So this is an index I, document type T and a document ID 42 because when you don't know, it's always 42. And it, it is a simple JSON document that has just one field called title, and it contains PyCon Belarus. Then I can run a query, so I construct a query. Query is, again, just a piece of JSON, on, or in our case, a Python dictionary. And I can then, again, uh, send, it to, uh, send it to Elasticsearch. So you could do this. But it's not really a good idea. There are, several, there are several reasons for that. First of all, that code was terrible. Like composing the URLs, like uh, gluing together strings, like you don't want to be there. Uh, that's the, the glorious uh, programming technique that gave us SQL injection and other great techniques uh, how to make your code explode. For example, uh, if you do a put, that's firmly harmless, but if you want to delete a document and you accidentally have a, give it an empty ID, well, suddenly you've deleted all your documents. That's not really nice. So what you want, uh, what you want to do instead is, is use some form of client. The other reason for that is 
Uh, there are many, many different URLs that, that Elasticsearch accepts, many different API endpoints. This is just a sample, actually. There are well over 100. Uh, there is uh, well over 1,000 parameters that they together can take, and it's, it's a lot, and you don't want to keep that in your memory or in your code. You want that to be outside in, in a library that, that someone else maintains. So that's the primary reason why uh, I, I wouldn't like to see you uh, using just, just requests, just some uh, plain HTTP client to talk to Elasticsearch. Another big reason is what I already mentioned again. Elasticsearch is distributed, which means that it can run on multiple, on multiple machines. In this case, we have three nodes, node one, node two, and node three. We have some data stored across them. That, that's, not, uh, that's not my point right now. My point is, what happens is if one of the nodes go down? Does your application still work? Elasticsearch can handle that. If, if in this scenario any of the nodes die, Elasticsearch will still be fine. It won't lose any data. But how about your application? If you, if you use HTTP to just talk to one to one nodes, you might be susceptible to, to failure. If that node goes down, your application is down, even though Elasticsearch is still up. It could also be that if you, if you keep hammering one node, you're, you're overloading that one node and uh, producing a hotspot in an otherwise distributed environment. So uh, that's, a, that's another thing, because you need some form of load balancing. And while you can do some of this externally, like put Nginx in front of it or something like that, there, there, there should be no need. Also, uh, when you run something that's been created for Elasticsearch, uh, it can do much more. It can, for example, go into the cluster and ask, because obviously the cluster has a list of nodes that it's, it's composed of. So you can say to your, to your Python client, go to node two, but don't c just connect to node two. Only go there to ask, what are all the nodes in the cluster? And then load balance across all of them. And actually you should do this every, every 60 seconds. This is great for long running processes like uh, uh, web servers or, or uh, queue workers, etc. So that Whatever happens in the background, if, for example, half of your nodes in Elasticsearch die and you replace them with new ones, your application will, uh, will adapt. You can always say, only do this when you encounter failure. So if you cannot connect to one of the nodes because it's down or something, then go and ask the remaining nodes what happened. Get me the list of new nodes that I can, I can talk to instead. So these are some of the reasons why we decided to create our own, uh, our own clients. And well, this is embarrassing. And, uh, and there, are so, there are some others. Uh, as I mentioned, you don't want to be maintaining all this code yourself. You want, you want, uh, you want someone to do it for you. You also want to be sure that the full API is, uh, is supported. So it's, it's not just the 10% the that people most often use. That's, that's uh, what was the situation where we first started thinking about creating our own clients. Do we need that? Shouldn't the community uh, uh, base clients be enough? Actually, most of them didn't support even 10% of the APIs because the author of the clients didn't, didn't need it. Uh, you also want to be able to do the load balancing, handle, no, uh, handle node failures gracefully, and also support different transports because every, uh, every environment is different. Some people will, will use a load balancer and talk to, talk to Elasticsearch through a load balancer. And in that case, you really need the client to be aware of that because at that point the client uh, shouldn't be doing its own load balancing. Uh, sometimes you have an you have an proxy in the middle that you need to authenticate against, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are many different uh, environments. Uh, one of my favorite is is Google App Engine that actually restricts uh, what you can do with with HTTP and and with Socket. So you need to use alternative method of transports. And uh, our uh, final guiding principle was no opinions. 
we wanted the client to have absolutely zero opinions. The reason for that is because we really wanted nobody to have a reason to not use the client. So whatever you do, whatever's your use case, whatever's your environment, you should be able to use this client. If whatever are your opinions, whatever are your priorities, you should not uh, have an excuse to not use this client. Which means that we couldn't make any decisions. Whenever we had a decision, we said no, nope, because that means that somebody could disagree with, with the way that we chose and would have a reason to not use the client. And that was the primary thing that we really, really needed to avoid. Because in order to give uh, the users the consistent experience, we did this across languages. So even when you, when you uh, go from one language to another, you use JavaScript and Python, uh, then you should have the same experience. Everything should be look the same and, and have the same set of features. And to do that, we really had to limit ourselves to just doing a one-to-one -one translation of the, of the HTTP API to Python. There's literally nothing else. The only difference is that instead of JSON, you can actually pass in uh, Python dictionaries and instead of gluing together the path, you have, uh, you have methods with, with parameters. But that's about it. You still need to uh, look all of them up. There will, there will be no, uh, no shortcuts or anything like that in the low-level client. Which is also, by the way, why we had to create another client. So don't worry about it. There, there will be some, ni some nice features coming, uh, coming later in the presentation. But this is where we uh, this is where we were at uh, to to specify just a clear one to one mapping and uh, be able to reach Elasticsearch and to be able to uh, make sure that this runs everywhere. Uh, we also made sure that everything is broken up underneath to be able to switch and replace any any piece. Uh, sort of my my test case for that was. Uh, I created a, a backend uh, b uh, using async IO with Python 3. And I was actually able to reuse the code. I was just, I'm just using the Elasticsearch client. And all I'm saying is instead of your default transport class that does everything as you would expect in a synchronous fashion, uh, just use my own async transport. So I created that and that's all I had to do, but everything else sort of falls, falls into place. I didn't have to re-implement the 100 plus uh, API methods and all the logic around load balancing, uh, et cetera. I just had to replace the one crucial part that had to be replaced because of the nature of my, uh, of my request, of my requirement, and everything else, uh, everything else was fine. Uh, and this again is something that's shared across all of the clients. There are all the different, all the different hooks into it. Transport client is sort of the the, the biggest one, uh, but you can also just specify your own connection class. So that's that's the Google App Engine use case, where instead of using URL app three, uh, you might want to use uh, their uh, URL fetch uh, API or uh, what's it called. Alternatively, if you have some weird scenarios. Uh, like N NTLM proxies, etc. You can just use uh, requests with multiple different plugins. That's what people use on AWS again to associate, uh, to be, uh, be able to authenticate against the IAM roles. Uh, so all of these things uh, need to be supported. And as I said, they need to be supported across the different across the different clients. And we had to make sure that they are in sync with Elasticsearch itself. So as part of Elasticsearch, we actually created two, two huge things. First is a uh, machine uh, readable definition of all the APIs. So uh, a list of all the APIs, a list of all the parameters that they take, what, the pa what does the path look, which parameters are required, which are optional, et cetera, et cetera. This enables us to uh, partially generate a lot of the code act actually because I don't want to be there typing 100 methods that are all exactly the same. They just differ in the path and the number of parameters. Uh, but they also enable us to test uh, this functionality that it is the same across all of our clients. 
because the second part that we created in Elasticsearch is, uh, is a test suite. So we came up with like a, a, a short DSL uh, in, in YAML where we have essentially a definition of perform this action, call this API with its parameters, and then run some assertions on the, on the data that comes back. And we run this as part of a release process uh, inside Elasticsearch itself, and we also run it for each and every client that we have, making sure that they all behave the same way, and even that the naming is consistent, that when you supply the same parameter names, that it will, that it will still work. This was invaluable to us when, whenever we have to do a migration to a new version or, or anything like that. So this, was, this is the result. Uh, the, uh, the final product we already, we already saw. So this is, this is a s very simple query. And you probably, some of you are laughing that I call this very simple, but yeah, it gets much, much worse. So this is uh, just uh, calling the search API over, over the index, my index. And what I'm looking here is I'm looking for, uh, for a document where the title matches, uh, matches Python, the description doesn't match beta, and it is in the category search. And then I want for, for the top 10 most popular tags, I want to see uh, the max number of, uh, number of lines. So this is actually a, a, some test code that I have for my, where I keep all my Git commits in Elasticsearch, and I can see all, this, all the statistics. But when you notice me reading what this query does, I read like 10% of the, of the code that's on screen, only the important part. Like I'm matching the title to be Python. All this crap, I don't, I don't care about. That, that's, just, that's just boilerplate. But because we have the, the no, no opinions, no decisions policy, this is what we had to do. Because with this, you can just, you can just write your query in any language or just using curl or uh, in a browser or something like that. Just copy paste it into Python and everything will work. However, there is another way. Because I, I, I write a lot of queries as, as, part, of my, as part of my job and I don't really like curly braces and all of the other stuff, like all the quotes and, and, and columns and everything. Like it, it makes my fingers hurt. So I thought that there must be a better way. Uh, the SQL people have discovered this a long time ago that you want to have something like an ORM. So first I, I started investigating, like could I, could I actually adapt something like Django's ORM to, to work with Elasticsearch? And the answer was yes, but. Uh, some of it might probably work, but generally what I would lose is most of the power of Elasticsearch. And at that point, why use Elasticsearch in the first place? And because I didn't want to be answering this question all over and over every time I go to a conference and, or talk to a, uh, talk to a developer, uh, I, I decided to create my own. So this is the Elasticsearch DSL is the is the name of the name of the library, and it allows me to uh, essentially express only what I what I need. So uh, when I when I'm going to read this, I can say I am I'm filtering f uh, for category to be search. I need to the title to match Python and the description to not match. There is a negation there not match beta. So a lot less typing and also all of the, uh, all of the mechanics were, were hidden away. But the uh, downside of this is I am still forcing you to know what's the difference between a match query and a term query. That's an Elasticsearch specific uh, thing and I, I'm a firm believer in uh, forcing people to actually learn even against their own will. So if you're going to use this, you need to, you need to study Elasticsearch. You need to know what it's capable of. You need to know what to type here in this, in this, first, in this first block because that is very important. So I'm hiding actually uh, the mechanics. I'm not hiding the meaning. Uh, what, what I uh, mean when I say that is I want you to write pretty much only what you need to 
but don't worry about how it actually is composed, uh, composed underneath. So it's f uh, fully okay for the abstraction to be leaky, to, uh, for you to have to know what, what's the difference between a match query and a multi-match or, or a query string or simple query string query. Uh, but you shouldn't have to know how to put two queries together because that's just a mechanic. So when we look again at our at our query, these are these are the mechanics. Like I don't. This is just this is just boilerplate. All I care about are these three queries and how they how they fit together. Uh, the same for the aggregation and also for the response. I don't want to know that there is a there is an object called hits which actually contains a list called another hits, and then I always have to do underscore source to get to any of my any of my stuff. That's both tedious again my hatred of, of uh, braces in this case, square brackets and quotes. I just don't want to do that. So instead what you do is you just express those three things that you want. The same for the, same for the aggregations and the same for the results. You can just iterate over the search. All of the stuff that was, that was there is still there, just hidden away because primarily when you, when you get a document back, you care about the document. You don't care about the score. You might care about that too, but probably it's just part of some meta information. So I reshuffled everything, provided an attribute level access to, to stuff. Again, avoid, uh, uh, avoid square brackets. I'm very, fond of my, I'm very fond of my fingers and not a very good typist. So this is something that, uh, that, that had to happen. So this is, so this is, the, this is sort of the uh, query builder part of the, of the DSL library, and that is, that sits on top of the low-level client. So we have the low-level client, Elasticsearch PY, and that was created to, to make everyone happy. So whenever somebody touches Python and Elasticsearch together, they should absolutely go through Elasticsearch PY. That's the no opinions, no excuses kind of library. For the DSL, to, to use that and uh, primarily to enjoy using that, you have to sort of agree with the decisions that I made. And that's not for everybody. I get that. I, I'm, I'm quite happy with what we, what we managed to do, but I'm not forcing this on anyone. If you say that you don't want to use this and you want to be writing your queries yourself, et cetera, go for it. We have a question? <laughs> Good question. Uh, so whether it works with the async client, uh, it still requires a little extra work. There is a ticket open for it to make it to make it seamless. We still haven't decided on what's the best way. But whatever you, uh, uh, this will actually work because you can always say s dot to dict and get the dictionary and and feed it feed it yourself. Not ideal, but it it's doable with some boilerplate code, and now we're figuring how to make that boilerplate code part of the DSL library so you don't have to do this. So, sort of, but it will get better. Uh, so yeah, if you don't want to use it, that's fine. I won't fight you on that. I would, however, fight you if, if you uh, decide to use Elasticsearch from Python and not use the, the a basic library, which is also why this sits on top of the basic library. So we chose our own, uh, we chose JSON, and we, we didn't go for any of the defined formats like there, like blueprints or swagger or, or stuff like that, primarily because uh, we, we started before those were, those were really popular. And also we found that they don't really provide all the options that we, that we have because Elasticsearch is not the typical REST API with the, with the resources and everything like that. It's more of a, a, a real API, like, a, like an RPC kind of situation. It's a, it's a data store. So the use cases didn't really align so that we could, we could use those tools uh, seamlessly. Uh, and we did the same for, for testing. We didn't cho uh, choose a tool like Dread or something that could actually automate that, uh, primarily because, again, we wrote it before Dread was created, uh, but also because we wanted something to be simple. We needed to implement it in all the, all the different languages. We have JavaScript, Python, PHP, Perl, uh, and, and, and some other that I co always keep forgetting. Oh, .NET, huh. <laughs> and 
uh, we, we needed to be we needed that to be simple. Make sense? Cool. So there are other there are other things as well in the DSL library and other questions that I get very often. I was I was surprised that it didn't didn't uh, come up yet. Uh, and uh, that's how to integrate with with other systems. How to integrate with Django or 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 uh, SQL Alchemy or other stuff. So we do have some sort of persistence mode where you can define your own your own documents as classes as python objects and work with them so you don't again have to work with with dictionary essentially like all of throughout this talk there's the, the f my fear of curly braces so this is another this is another example of that where i just i just can create my fields and uh, and then use the document as i would expect like create the document, give it, give it the attributes, call dot save on it, etc. But again, we didn't uh, use anything that's existing, like ad trying to adapt SQL Alchemy or the Django's ORM, because uh, Elasticsearch is is quite unique. You see here uh, multi equals true, which means that tags is automatically going to be a list. Uh, so without even defining it, I can just say tags dot append, and for tags, I'm, I'm doing it explicitly in Python, but from the Elasticsearch side of, uh, of the conversation, Elasticsearch doesn't care about any single value, whether it's a, a string or a list of strings, or a date or a list of dates. So I could very easily say the title is a list of, of, all, of these, all of these different, uh, different titles. And that's uh, second nature, well, first nature to Elasticsearch, uh, but to, to replicate that with something like uh, like Django RM, it would be very hard. Also, if you want to have nested nested objects, so in tags instead of just a list of strings, it would be a list of objects which each has a has a string and a URL and maybe an ID. Uh, and that would be that would be very hard. So again, we would have the two options: either do it ourselves, which is clearly what one. Or, or sort of dumb it down and remove a lot of the functionality and a lot of the benefits. And at that point, again, what's, what's the point of using Elasticsearch? We already have good databases out there. We, we don't want to replace them. We want to allow you to do more, to allow you to do things that those databases don't necessarily want to or can do. So once you have, once you have this, it's actually quite easy to uh, integrate that into Django. So this is my Django models. I have my model blog post. And this is my recommended way of doing it. There are uh, the number of people that you, that you ask, you will probably get at least that many opinions on how to do this, probably even more. So what I, what I prefer is to just define a two search method that actually returns not the model instance, but the instance of the document. And then everything becomes super simple. If you want to do, if you want to do the synchronization over signals, this is literally all the code that you need. If you want to bulk load everything, you can just say, uh, just iterate over uh, blog post dot objects dot all dot iterator, and just call to search serialize it and feed it into, into the bulk API. That again becomes, uh, becomes a one-liner. And also this is a very convenient place uh, to sort of assemble the document. Because typically your document looks completely differently from your model. That's because the, the model, that's from, that's from an ORM, right? And the, the R in the ORM is kind of important. That's because it dictates the underlying model. Everything is stored in tables, in relations, in, uh, in a relational database. And that's good, but Elasticsearch doesn't have that. But on the other hand, it has all these powerful features of, of JSON, so anything you can express as JSON, you can use. So in this case, uh, the original model has tags as like a, a, a many-to-many -many field. So in, instead of serializing that as a list of IDs or something like that, what I do here is I say just get the, get the tags and serialize the list of names of the tags and just put it directly onto the document when indexing it. 
And there is one nice trick that I, uh, that I like to use that didn't fit on the screen. And that is if you name things the same way. So in this case, if I were to, uh, the tags were not a field, but a property that actually returns, that runs this, this query and returns the tags or the names, then uh, other layers of your stack, for example, templates, will not be able, or uh, more importantly, will not need to, distinguish whether they're working with the model or with the document. And it only follows naturally that with my fear of curly uh, braces, I also don't like the pointy ones. So I don't like writing HTML. So this allows me to have just one set of templates in my, in my Django project. And I don't care whether the template is being fed a model instance or a doc type instance. And this allows some very interesting, interesting functionality where Elasticsearch is much easier to scale than your traditional uh, relational database. For example, to run Postgres on multiple machines, it's certainly possible and there are, there are people who can do it. There are great people in the world who can do it, but both of them are very expensive. Uh, but to run multiple instances of Elasticsearch, that's literally just typing one more command and run the, the instance with the same configuration. They'll find each other, form a cluster, and suddenly you have much more capacity. So what we see a lot of a lot of the times is people still use their their Postgreses and their and their unfortunately MySQLs for for all the writing and for uh, using it as the master version of the truth, but then they would uh, serialize everything into into Elasticsearch using this or similar approach and are powering all the reads from Elasticsearch, which means it's it's much more uh, much more uh, scalable but also much more uh, performant. Not ne necessarily because Elasticsearch is so much better than, let's say, Postgres, though I think it is. But uh, but because of because of this, because of the amount of work that that we've put into uh, de uh, deserializing uh, the denormalizing the document so that everything is in one place. So when you get a document back from Elasticsearch, you already have everything. You don't have to run another query to get all the tags or get the author name and email. Uh, you don't have to follow foreign keys or figure out how select related works so that all of this is already there for you. We have prepaid all, all the price for that at, at index time, at the time where we were actually pushing data into Elasticsearch. So this is a very nice and very cheap way how to, how to scale uh, your read parts of Elasticsearch, uh, of your Django application. And uh, one last little feature that we have is something to enable you to do faceted search easily. So this is faceted search. This is what this interface is called. This, uh, uh, this is a particular site you know, that, I, that I wrote in my spare time, uh, I wish. Uh, and what you're doing here is you're searching, and you have your, your, your results here. And here you have your so-called facets. Uh, which are essentially insights into your data. So this middle part is great if you know what you're looking for. If you're looking for PyCon or Django or something like that, you type it in, you get the results back, you're super happy. This part is great to know what you could be looking for, what actually is in the data. So just looking at this, when I search for PyCon, I can see that most of my hits are actually written in Python. That actually makes kind of sense. I would kind of be interesting what the nine Ruby hits that, that are about PyCon uh, are. I can also see that there are 44 users, etc. cetera. So these, this is facet navigation, a very powerful interface that you're absolutely very familiar with from all the different websites out there. But it can be very tricky to, to implement. Because for example, once you click here, once you click on the Ruby, you want to see the, actually the nine, uh, the nine Ruby repositories that uh, that mention PyCon. Uh, what would what will happen here, and what will happen here? Obviously, you filter the results so they would only contain uh, the uh, the uh, Ruby language hits. 
but you don't want to filter the languages themselves because that would completely destroy the information that Ruby has nine hits, whereas Python has 794. And that's you know, sort of bragging rights that you don't, don't just want to hide. So to implement this properly, you would have to take this filter, apply it here, apply it here, and not apply it here. And if you chose another filter here, you would again have to apply it here, apply it here, and not apply it there. And now imagine that you have 77 of these, these facets. That gets a little complicated. So what you can do instead is just define a faceted search. So like we have the document types, we also have a class to actually help you with the, with the faceted search. It's part of, the, part of the DSL. And all you have to do is define the doc types that you want to search over, define the fields that you want to do the full text on when somebody types something. Uh, that's what you want to search through. And then define your facets. So in, the, in my case, I have, I have two. I have, I have tags, which is just what we saw what we saw there with the languages, et cetera, it would look exactly the same. And I get, and I get months, so which is for my, for my blog post, what is my, what is my publication history? Well, for my blog is straight zeros, but maybe for a popular blog it would be better. And this is, this is then how you use it, how you instantiate. You just give it the query that the user, your user typed in and the list of, and the list of filters. So this is, this is the part that you put into, into your view. And that's pretty much it, what we have, what we have for now. What's there for the future? What, what are my plans? And well, I wouldn't call them plans, I would call them wishes, because plans typically have a timeline associated with them. So my wish would be, for example, to go from, go from this to a form, to a Django form, to a, a WT form or something, uh, to, to allow you to use this from your view much, much eas easily. My, my wish would be to make it work with the uh, async IO backend and, and other things. Uh, but primarily, uh, I'm quite happy with where things are, but that doesn't mean, as I, as I mentioned, that everybody else is happy. So I'm always looking, looking for, for feedback or for, uh, for opinions or anything like that or in this particular case, any questions? <laughs>